Well, hello everyone, and welcome once again to those who are gathering here and those that are joining us online. We do appreciate it, and uh, we're grateful for you joining us, and we're, we're grateful for the support that you give uh, to the ministry so that we can do the things that we need to do to get the Word of God out there, along with some of the, the mission stuff that we're doing. It's, it's, uh, it goes a long ways, and we do greatly appreciate your support in all avenues. And we really appreciate your support with your prayers that you put out there into the spirit world to get things done and to pave the way for, for people to walk down and yourself to walk down uh, as we're all trying to accomplish what the Lord thy God wants on the face of this earth. So thank you very much for that and welcome uh, once again. So let's go to prayer and we're going to start off with our sermon today. Father God, we come before you. We thank you as we always do, Father. Thank you first with thanksgiving in our hearts, Father what you've put in our lives, for what you've put in front of us, Father. We accept the obligation and the responsibility that you've laid out there, Father. And we will adhere. We will answer the bell, Father, when you call. And we will fulfill the destiny in which you have placed within our lives on the face of this earth. We're grateful for it, Father. And we hope to serve you to our best. And we achieve that, Father, through your greatness and becoming more and like you every single day. In Yeshua's name we pray. We bind up darkness right now. And what's bound on this earth is bound in heaven itself. And we release the anointing to go forth to the four corners of the earth this day, this hour, and into the future and take this message to the hearts of the people so that they too know who they are. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. We're going to jump around a little bit. And we've been talking about God's divine order and authority for the church and the family, uh, a, a book that was written by my mentor, for those of you who don't know, Prophet Tom. And we're just going through this, what God had dropped into his bucket and bringing it forth because it didn't die. It never got old. And it's the same thing that's going on today. And I wanted to bring that out because there's some stuff that is in here that is kind of relevant for today. And we may get to that uh, this week. We may get to it a little bit next week. But there's some stuff that was said in there that's pertaining to the world events that are going on in this day and this hour. And you can see the anarchy and, and things like that. You can see where the church has dropped the ball. And he, he talks about some of that stuff and what God had showed him. So we'll get to that. We'll see if it comes up today and see how far we, we get along with this, uh, going down this road. Now, I said to my wife before I was coming over here, like, have you ever had one of those days where you get up and you just don't feel like going to work? Well, one of those days was kind of like that for me to come up here. And I was like, I really don't want to. I just don't feel like preaching today. I just, you know what it is? A little bit of lazy, a little bit of relaxed. So let's just see where God actually takes us, because I know from my past experience, when that, whenever that's happened, things have always really just flowed because you just lay down. Even when you're playing sports, sometimes the best games that you ever play are the games that you didn't feel like even going, and you're just relaxed, and, and you're just allowing things to happen, and it flows into what God really wants and what we're supposed to get done. You see, but we have this image, and the church has got an image out here. When I say the church, I'll say the, the people of God. We'll use that terminology. But if the people of God are going to see what they're expecting to see with this last great outpouring of the Holy Ghost, we had better straighten ourselves up. And we had better get lined up with the scripture a lot better than what the main population out there within the church family is actually doing. It's time to wake up out there and start lining up with the expectation that God has and not the expectation that we've set for what we want. But there's always been a certain type. There's always been a, a remnant. There's always been somebody who always kind of strayed away from what the mainstream religion was telling you and went and sought things out and tried to get to some truths because something was just angsting, angsting them in the inside. And knowing that there's got to be more, there's got to be more, and there's got to be more. And a lot of us have done that who are listening this day and this hour. The people that are in the, will listen to this in the future, they're going to go through the same thing. They know there's more, and they're out there, and they're searching. I'm not saying jump out there and listen to every rabbi or every Tom, Dick, and Harry out there. That's not what it's about. It's about seeking out the things of God the way that God truly wants it and questioning, am I doing it the way that God wants it? 
Is this set up the way that God wants it? Or am I involved with something? Am I involved with an organization that has got a wrong doctrine? You see, because with 2,300 different sects of Christianity out there, you've got 2,300 different doctrines. You've got 2,300 different ways of looking at Scripture and taking that Scripture and applying that Scripture. Now, when you get into a doctrine, that's an interpretation of what God said. So somewhere along the line, this gets very serious. You see, there's different ways that people do things, and that's okay. Sometimes there's, there's right and wrong, and sometimes there's just different. But those differences have absolutely nothing to do with denominations. It's either right or it's wrong when it comes to de denominations. And that's where this whole thing gets really out of whack when there's a lot of wrongs that are happening out there. And all it takes is one little thing, and somebody goes out there and they start a new denomination because they don't agree with that aspect of a doctrine, and that's the way it's always gone. But God has always had a remnant that he's pulled out and to move things forward, you, can, you have to sit back and you've got to ask yourself, why aren't we all Roman Catholic? Because that's all there was at one point in time. You had Brother Judah and you had the Roman Catholics. So you're either going to be a Jew or you're going to be a Roman Catholic. Why aren't we Roman Catholic? Well, it's because God has transitioned. And God is transitioning into the end times here with a great outpouring of the Holy Ghost. But that can only happen to those who are following his ways. And because of that, it doesn't come just by chance. It doesn't come just by what? Hearing by oops. No, it comes to those who are seeking. Those who are seeking out and those who are seeking out the face of the Father for his absolute truths within his word, they're going to come and they're going to receive the things that God has got set in store for this generation. But there's many people who are not going to seek out what God has set in store for this generation. They're just going to continue doing and going on with what has always gone on. And that's where things get a little bit sticky as well, because when God's always moving forward and moving ahead, and we get stuck in a certain spot in a certain denomination with their rules, and they don't move and budge from that, at some point in time, God picks himself up, goes upon the threshold, and right out the door, just like happened in Ezekiel 8 through, uh, through 11. The anointing leaves because God has gone on and, and, and departed from there because he's moved past there. Now, what was going on in that aspect in that day and age is there were getting into the worship of Tammuz, the worship of the sun god. And you can see that all the way through many different denominations of Christianity. You can see sun worship. Well, you could start off with the Sunday thing. That's where that one started. But you can see, you look in some, you see the stained glass in some places, and they got the image of a person, and behind their head, it's like glowing. That's the sun god. And this is up on the walls of the church, on the windows of the church. The only thing that should be on in, in, the, in the church, what do we always have? The cherubims. God always had cherubims in there. Why? It's what protecting the anointing. And when you bring the sun god inside the building of worship, you are not going to have the presence of the Father in there because you cannot mix the holy with the profane. And that's why it's so important to make sure that there's no profanity in our belief system. And profaning the word of God by saying it says this when it doesn't say that. That's profaning the name of the Lord thy God. And we've got to make sure that we line up completely according to God's interpretation, not our interpretation. It's not up to us about what God wants and what God wants for his people, the way that his people have always done things and the way that God has always wanted his people to do exactly what he asked them to do. Nothing more, nothing less. If you want to go for bonus round, that's fine. Go above and beyond, that's fine. Make sure you're doing everything. And it says what? All, all. It's always about all. But we get out here and we sometimes we, you know, you look at stepping away from mainstream religion. And many people have done that. They've stepped away from mainstream religion because they know there's more. And then they turn around and they get laughed at. But it's the same pattern that has always happened. It's always happened like that where somebody's gone out. And when you're the first out of the gate, people are going to look at you. They're going to point a finger at you. They're going to say, what's wrong with you? But it's always happened like that with God's people. That's the way it's always gone on. It's the reason why we're not Roman Catholics anymore. 
transitioned away, sought more. And this is what God needs from his people. He needs them to seek him out for what he's got for this generation. Do you know what he's got for this generation yet? If your answer is no, then seek him out. Because there's more to this genera- for this generation than there was for the last generation. And the, that generation had more than what was for the generation before that. You see, what we're talking about today is about being called and being called into the ministry that God has placed within your life. And you can't get called to the depth of the ministry within your life with profanity. And if you're profaning the name of God by doing things that are contrary to his word, you'll never fulfill the destiny to the fullest that he's placed within your life. You'll never get to the power. You'll never get to the miracles. And there's a reason why you don't see the power. You don't see the miracles out here in your everyday church. There's a reason for it. There's a reason why it's like, come in, sit down, take up the offering, sing a few songs. Preacher talks for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Put a little wafer in your mouth, turn around and go home. God's not even in the building, but they go through the same routine over and over and over, just like it was going on in Ezekiel. And you better take a good hard look at that. What are you doing to seek out for what God's got for you in this generation? You see, we got to look at some parallels in Scripture about how some of these guys were called, what they went through, because we're all real people. You're going to have real emotions. Yeah, we don't live by emotions. We don't live by feelings. But God created emotions, and he put them in us. It's like he created the five senses. Why? Because we couldn't. he knew we couldn't be governed right from the very beginning by the Spirit. We couldn't be led by the Spirit. So he had to put in some things. And if we look at some parallels in Scripture, we can go to Matthew 28, 18, and we'll start off there. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. You see, they were what? They were, at that point in time, they were the ministry. They were the ministry, and everything that went on, went on through them and with them. Now, you see that they take off, and they go their separate ways. Some of them went on journeys. They didn't just jump in an airplane and get to a destination. No, they packed up the donkey. They packed up the camel. They jumped on the horse. They got their chariot. They got their water buckets. They got all their wineskins. They took everything with them. And then they started out on their journey. And just think, if they had to travel 100 miles, how many miles could they go a day? 10? 20? Maybe on a good day, 30? And we just jump in the car and we just drive down the road 30 miles like it's nothing. And it really is today. But think of what they went through. Think of what they went through. You see, the church at that point in time and the church of today, they hung, they hung the Messiah on the tree. Now, did that have to be fulfilled in Scripture? Yes. So did God work on some hearts for that to get done? Absolutely he did. But at the same time, we've got to look at the cross, and we've got to look at God laying on there, hanging up there for us. And this is what these guys were commissioned to do. They were commissioned to take his words and the things that he brought forth, his blood shed for us and spread it across the face of the earth. And they got it done with camels and donkeys. Do you think we can make a quick work in the end time? It shouldn't take too much with the internet. It shouldn't take too much with airplanes and automobiles and motorcycles, which I love. It doesn't take, it doesn't take that much. We have telephones where we can just pick up a phone. We don't have to send a messenger. We don't have to send a a messenger dove out there anymore. No, we have these things available. And this is one of the reasons why things can get done so quick in the end time. Because God's involved. God is involved taking it to the four corners of the earth. And this is what we're supposed to be bringing forward. As our Lord crucified, our God 
Well, I shouldn't say our God, our Messiah, crucified on our behalf, shed his blood. Shed his blood. That's the message that they were taking out there. Why? It's about getting people saved. It's about getting people to heaven. That's the commission. That's the commission. And commanding them to do it properly and to live a life accordingly. And how do they do that? They do that through keeping the commandments of the Father. Well accepting what the Messiah did for us. And that's what the whole part of it is. But that's where the mess comes in. Because people think, oh, I've got the testimony now. And modern church has done this. We've got the testimony. We don't need to listen to the other part now. We don't need the Ten Commandments anymore. Then what do you govern your life by? Well, the Ten Commandments. Well, that's part of the law. You can't keep part of it and throw away some of it. You have to keep it. Keep it the way that God said to keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. Here's the blessings if you do, and here's the curses if you don't. Do you agree to it? And when you accept Jesus Christ, you're accepting God's ways. You've agreed to it, and now you're defiling it. Look out, scout. You're going to be in a whole bunch of trouble. You see, when we look at Scripture, and we look at what was going on when he, he commanded these guys, and he taught them, and he showed them, and he said, go out to the four corners. He commanded each and every one of them equally to go out and give them a specific role what to do, but it was all the same. Now, like I said, they went all their separate ways and they brought, the four, brought it out to the four corners. They probably didn't see each other for years sometimes. Maybe it was a year. Maybe they would come back on the feast, the festivals. Sometimes they were what rushing back, we can see, to make it back for the festivals. But let's look in Luke 5, 1. One day as Yeshua was standing on the shore at Lake Kinneret, with the, with the people pressing in around him in order to hear the word of God, he noticed two boats pulled up on the beach, left there by the fishermen who were, who were cleaning their nets. He got in one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat, just so he could have a little bit of space. He had to get out in the water. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into... Put, put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, we've worked hard all day and all night long, Rabbi, and haven't caught a thing. But if you say so, let down the nets, guys. Then did, they did this and took so many fish. They took so many fish in that their nets began to tear. So they motioned to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats to the point of sinking. When he saw this, Simon Peter fell at Yeshua's knees and said, get away from me, sir, because I'm a sinner. Now, we're talking about Peter here. We're talking about Peter. For astonishment had seized him and everyone with him at the catch of fish they had taken. And likewise, both Jacob, Yaakov, which is James. There is no James in the Bible. It's Yaakov. King James wanted his name in the Bible, so he changed it to James. That's how that happened. And likewise, both Yaakov and John, Simon's partners, don't be frightened, Yeshua said to Simon. From now on, you will be catching men alive. And as soon as they had beached their boats, they left everything behind and followed him. You see, here we see Jesus Christ. He's got a problem that he comes up with. He's facing this. Here's my solution. I'm going to jump with this boat. Hey, just push the boat out. Give me some space because the people are crowding in. People can't see. If I get out there a little ways, oh, maybe from about here to the camera away, at least they're not going to come in the water and get their shoes wet and all that and their clothes wet. At least the people will be able to see me. And from there it went, what? From there it transitioned. As soon as he did that, something else could happen. And the something else that you've got to do in your life could lead to something great that could happen. But it's just one thing that you've got to do. You've got to step out. We'll get back to Peter stepping out of the boat. But Jesus went out and Jesus stepped into the boat first. He stepped into the boat. They pushed the boat out. He brought the word forth. You'll see later in scripture where it's Peter that's stepping out of the boat. Full circle, full circle. 
But we see Peter going through this whole situation here that we just read. And Jesus telling him, hey, you know, throw your nets down again. We've been out there all day. I'm a professional fisherman. I know what I'm doing. Today's not the day. Maybe it was too sunny. Maybe they got out there late. Maybe the swarms weren't there. There's swarms of fish. Flocks of fish. Herds of fish. Maybe they're not out there. And what'd he do? He just thought he had it all figured out, didn't he? He forgot about something, though. And he was learning a very valuable lesson that with God, all things are possible. He was also learning to trust his mentor. He was learning to trust his mentor. He was learning to trust the word of God above what he knew in him. He was learning to trust. And with God, all things are possible. You see, we got Peter here, though. You see, Peter must have received this Bible teacher and knowing that he was so much more than just that. But at some point in time through that transition, Peter had to accept what was actually going on there. You see, any time that we are willing to give up, to give in, and to accept the destiny within your life, God can take and God can multiply that back over and over and over again. But you've got to step out. you got to push offshore sometimes. Sometimes we have to get into uncomfortable waters. We're not made to be in water. We don't live in water and we can't breathe in water. We're not meant to be out there. But at the same time, if you step out, if you step out, and that's what we've got to do, but we get complacent. We get complacent. We like our little world that we live in. We like the little job that we have. You realize that people sit there and they think about how much they've given up for God and I've given up this. and I've. G-. Most people have had more taken away than they've given. Do you realize that? What have you willingly, openly said, I am doing this? They had to go through it there. They had to walk away from careers. They had to walk away from things that they thought that they're probably getting to the point in time where they're starting to look at retirement. And they had to turn around and they had to walk away from it. What have people truly given up? Truly given up for the Father? Given up. Made a conscious decision to chase after him. When you do that, God can multiply it. He can multiply it. Because God is there. God is with, it, with you. And you've got to know that. And you've got to know this God that we serve. Let's jump down to Matthew 14, 22. Matthew 14, 22. You see, when we get to this point in time, we've gone through some history with these guys. They were sitting there and they were looking throughout the course of their ministries that they had, where they, while they were being groomed, mentored, taught who they were, and going through the process of being sent forth to the four corners of the earth to bring the gospel around. They saw all manner of miracles. But again, it was Peter. It was Peter who got out of the boat at one point in time. It was Peter who walked on the water. Again, it's all part of the story. It's all part of the story. It started off with Peter's boat. To the Peter's fish, to Peter stepping out of the boat. Neat, eh? Isn't it funny how God works? Matthew 14, 22. Matthew 14, 22. Immediately after the Talmudium get, uh, Talmudium, get in the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. Well, he sent the crowds away. After he had sent the crowds away, he went to the hills by himself to pray. Night came on and he was there alone. But by this time, the boat was several miles from shore, battling rough seas and a headwind. Around four o'clock in the morning, he came toward them, walking on the lake. When the Talmudium saw him walk on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, screaming with fear. But once again, Yeshua spoke to them. Courage, he said. It is I. Stop being afraid. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come out to you on the water. 
Come, he said. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water toward Yeshua. But when he saw the wind, he became afraid and he began to sink. He yelled, Lord, save me. And Yeshua immediately stretched out his hand, took hold of him and said to him, such little trust, why do you doubt? Come on, Peter, why do you doubt? Such little trust. As they went up in, into the boat, the wind seized. Could you imagine that walk back to the boat? Okay, just hold my hand, because if I let go, I'm going to sink. Just hold my hand, hold my hand, hold my hand. My granddaughter is just learning how to walk. And then she's, as long as you hold her hand, she'll walk with you. You let go of her hand, she'll take two steps, and then just want to plop down on her butt. It's the same thing as sinking in the water. It's the same kind of faith. It's the same, same kind of trust. What it comes down to is you can do it. You just got to have the confidence that you can do it. You can do it. Step out of the boat. Step out of the boat in your walk. Give God something to work with in your, in your life. Don't be complacent and just expect things to work that the way that they've always worked. It's never worked like that. It's never happened like that. That's not consistent with the way that God has ever done anything. So why do we get into this complacency and why do we not step out of the boat? Step out of the boat, push offshore a little bit. Get yourself into some rough waters and let God be God. Let God grab your hand. Let God pull you up. Let him show you. Let him teach you. You see, people criticize Peter for, Peter for his lack of faith here, but at the same time, he actually did something about it. Give God something to work with, and he can do something with it. Give him something to work with, and he can do something with it. And that's what we've all got to do. We've all got to do that. You see, sometimes doesn't what Peter went through, doesn't that just remind us of ourselves? We get out there, we hear some bad news about something, and we start to sink. We've all been there. Come on, put your hands up. But then we grasp hold of it again, and if you look back, it's okay. You know, look back on the problems that you had a year ago. Are they the same problems that you have today? Likely not. Did they work themselves out? Look back and think about it. Meditate on it. Look at the process of coming out of it. How much did you rely on the Father? Could you have shortened it to a week instead of taking months? Possibly. But understand who we are. Understand who you are. Understand who you are in him. Because the Peter syndrome, the Peter syndrome, Mark 9, 1. Yes, he went on. I tell you that there are some people standing here who will not experience death until they see the kingdom of God come in a powerful way. Six days later, Yeshua took Peter. Ooh, six days. Got to look into that one. Already did. Six days later, Yeshua took Peter, Jacob, and John and led them up the, 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 the high mountain privately. As they watched, he began to change form. And his clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could possibly bleach them. Then they saw Elihu and Moses speaking with Yeshua. Peter said to Jesus, or Kepha said to Yeshua, it's good that we are here, Rabbi. Let's put up some shelters. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. You see, Peter didn't know what to do. Peter's flesh and blood. We're all flesh and blood. There's going to be points in times where you get into predicaments and you don't know what to do. And here he goes on, he kind of, they probably looked at him like, who's this bambling idiot? But you know what he did? He was frightened. But he was still paying homage. He was still trying to be respectful. From that point on, uh, Matthew uh, 16, 21. We'll jump down that one. From that, from that time on, Yeshua began making it clear to his Talmudium that he had to go to Jerusalem and endure much suffering at the hands of the elders, the head Koh Kohanim, and the Torah teachers and that he had to be put to death. But that on the third day, he had to be raised. So he knew going in there that he had to be put to death, and he was trying to prepare these guys for it. Talk about being merciful. Could you imagine going in there blind and not knowing exactly what was going to happen and then what went on? But he prepared them because it had to be done, because the lamb had to be slaughtered for the sacrifice for our sin. 
Matthew 16, 22, Peter took him aside and began rebuking, rebuking him. Heaven be merciful, Lord. By no means will this happen to you. What did you just do, Peter? But Yeshua turned his back on him, on Peter, and saying, get behind me, Satan. You're an obstacle in my path because your thinking is from a human perspective, not from God's perspective. Jesus Christ knew what he had to do. Did Peter want to see his friend die? Did he want to see his mentor die? Absolutely not. But they had been prepared to go to the four corners of the earth and been instructed to take the message of God to the four corners of the earth. And then we got Jesus Christ here. He knew what he had to do in order for that to get accomplished. He knew that sin had to be forgiven once and for all by the sacrifice of his flesh and his body. And that's what they brought around the face of the earth. And could you imagine what they went through watching their friend, their mentor, die? But it had to be done. But they didn't understand it. They couldn't comprehend it. Why? Because this stuff's not comprehensible with a human mind, with a human perspective. The way things often operate with the Father is, is beyond what we can comprehend. He knows what he created, and he stays one step ahead of us until the point in time of it to be revealed into this realm. They didn't understand. Jesus Christ knew. He knew exactly what he had to do. You see, it was his, his imagination. Could you imagine rebuking Jesus Christ? Could you just imagine how that conversation went and the expression on some of the faces around there? But it couldn't be. It can't be. It can't be. It can't be. There's no way it can happen like that. It can't be like that. Oh, yes, it can. And yes, it is. But what happened? We got Peter here. We got Peter beginning to think that he knows just as much as his instructor. And this can happen, and this does happen. And what happens to those people? They become unteachable. They become unteachable. When you won't hear another perspective, when you won't listen to anybody else, and you got it all figured out, you have become unteachable. And that's where it gets in dangerous territory because you lock yourself in. When you lock yourself in, you open yourself up and make you susceptible because you're not keeping up with the cadence of Christ, the cadence of God, the cadence of the Holy Ghost, the Godhead on the face of this earth. Father, then the Son, then the Holy Ghost. Do we ever see Jesus Christ trying to correct the Father? No. We ever see Jesus Christ instructing the Father? No. You ever see the Holy Ghost instructing Jesus Christ? He had authority and sent it back. He had authority over it, just like the Father sent the Son. That's the order of the Godhead. That's the order of the Godhead and the reason why the instruction could come. Instruction has to come. God instructs. God will instruct you for your life. Every person. God will instruct the head of the home for the home. And God will use his fivefold the way that he said it in his scripture. And we've talked about it through this, this series already. God will use his fivefold to instruct his people the way that he needs them instructed. Turn left here. Turn right there. Don't get yourself caught. Don't get yourself in danger. He's giving us a roadmap as we're walking the road. It's a live trial. And this is a live race that we're living. And it's a race to the end of the days that we walk the face of this earth. But it's always time to time that we seem to ourselves, we can fall into these traps. You start hearing something and the next thing you know, you want, well, why would he say that when, and then, what is it all about? Well, first of all, it's about not having the material inside of you. It's still sitting on your shoulder. It's still sitting on your bookshelf. It's got to be internal. It's got to be in your heart. Because this is what the Father wants brought out for this day, for this hour that we walk in. Because order needs to be restored. 
the order in which he had set up, set things up with the fivefold ministry, it needs to be restored. The family needs to be restored. The order within the home needs to be restored. And the order within your life needs to be restored. It's time for a restoration of the things of the Father. And God's going to get done on the face of this earth the way that he wants to get done and how it's got to get done. And it's, he's going to bring it forth in his proper way. But you have to have it inside of you. You've got to know that you know that you know. Matthew 26, 26. While they were eating, talking about Peter here, Peter, Peter learning a, another lesson. Yeshua took a pizza matzah. He made the baraka, which is the blessing, and he broke it. And he gave it to the Talmudium and said, take, eat, this is my body. He also took a cup of wine and made the baraka and gave it to them and said, all of you drink from it. For this is my blood, which ratifies the new covenant. My, my blood shed on behalf of many, so that they may have their sins forgiven. And that goes back to Jeremiah 31, 31. That's the new covenant. It wasn't replacement. It's not a replacement theology. That's the covenant that he's referring to. That was prophesied. I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of this vine again until the day I drink new wine with you in my father's kingdom. After singing the halal, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Yeshua said to them, tonight you will lose faith in me. You will all lose faith in me. As the Tanakh says, I will strike the shepherd dead and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you into the Galil. I will never lose faith in you, Peter said. Even if everyone else does, Yeshua said to him, yes, I tell you that tonight before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Oh, even if I must die with you, Peter replied, I will never disown you. And all the Talmudium said the same thing. You see, in the verse prior, we see Christ told the disciples about betrayal that one would betray him. And here in 31, Christ is telling him that what? They would all fall away from him that night. They would all fall away from him that night. And Peter's saying, oh, I'm not going to do it. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not going to say anything wrong about you. No way. Sorry, Peter. Sorry, Peter. This is what's going to happen. As much as he had his heart set on it, it still happened, didn't it? It still happened. And this is what we're speaking about when we're talking about what? We get into the things of self-sufficiency. When you think you know, and you think you know, and it's out of order. Matthew 26, 69, jump down. Peter was sitting outside the courtyard, and when the servant girl came up to him, you too were with Yeshua from Gilead, he said, but he denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about. If you just imagine old rough, gruff Peter. He went out on the porch, and another girl saw him. And said to the people, this man was with Yeshua of Nazareth. Again, he denied it. Swearing. I don't know the man. Who knows what else he said along with it. And after a little while, the bystander approached keep, uh, Peter and said, you must be one of them. Your accent gives you away. This time he began to invoke a curse on himself as he swore. I don't know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. He began to invoke a curse on himself as he swore, I don't know the man. I don't know the man. There's going to come a point in time in this world, in your walk, where you're going to be challenged. Do you know the man? Do you know the man from Nazareth? Do you know this Jesus Christ? Do you believe in this Jesus Christ? That's going to come in this day, in this hour, in this generation, with everything that's going on, with the end times coming into a, what? Accelerated apex? These things are going to happen. You're going to be challenged. And what are you going to say? Are you going to deny? Are you going to begin to invoke a curse on yourself? Are you going to deny Watch out for the rooster. Watch out for the rooster. You don't want to hear the rooster crow. 
You don't want to hear the rooster, the rooster crow. But Peter was finding out at some point in time here that he couldn't do anything without Christ. You know, in 74, Matthew 26, 74, this time he began to invoke a curse on himself and he swore, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crow, he became so frustrated, so angry, probably looking at himself, knowing that he was a man's man. He would get up in people's face. He was a fisherman. He was a tough guy. That's not an easy job to do. And here he's what? Fallen to pieces. Fallen to pieces. Could you imagine the emotional roller coaster that they were going through? Could you imagine everything that they had and it was just being taken away? Every, their friend was getting slaughtered. He didn't want to die with him. He didn't want to die like that. But he knew that his mentor had to. He knew that Jesus Christ had to. Matthew 26, 47. While Yeshua was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a large crowd carrying swords and clubs from the head Kohanim and the elders of the people. The betrayer had arranged to give them a, a signal. The man I kiss is the one you want. Grab him. Then he went straight up to Yeshua, and he said, Shalom, Rabbi. Then he moved forward and laid hold of Yeshua. Oh, and then he kissed him. Yeshua said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they moved forward, laid hold of Yeshua, and arrested him. Now, a lot of people point a finger at the fact of what he did here. At the same time, God knew. God knew what had to get done. Yeshua said to him, friend, do what you came to do. Then they moved forward and laid hold of Yeshua and arrested him. At that, one of the men with Yeshua reached for his sword and drew it out and struck the servant of the Kohen, Hagol, cutting off his ear. Yeshua said to him, put your sword back where it belongs, for everyone who uses a sword will die by the sword. Don't you know that I can ask my father and he will instantly provide me more than a dozen armies of angels to help me? But if I did that, how could the passages in the Tanakh be fulfilled that says it has to happen this way? You see, in verse 53 there, it confirms right here the order of the Godhead. Don't you know that I can ask my father? I can ask my father. You see, when we get into John 18, John 18, 10, it says here that it was Peter who cut off the ear of the soldier. It was Peter. Here Peter is fighting and fighting and fighting. And then all of a sudden what happens? Something happened to Peter. When it came right down to it, his heart crumbled. Everything took over. And that's the point in time where you got to get to. And when you get to that point is when you've got to stand strong. You may fail one time, but don't fail twice. And definitely do not fail three times. The purpose of temptation will bring upon a curse upon yourself if you keep failing. You've got to understand and understand what we're talking about in the depth of Scripture. But when you get into the things of denial, and you get into the things of the Father, and you get into the things of the Son, you better have it all correct. You better have it lined up. And before you open your mouth and you prophesy and you say this and you say that, you better know, but with 2,300 different sects of Christianity, there's so many people out there who don't know, and they are denying God's ways. When you start denying God's ways, you are denying everything that he stands for. You are denying the system in which he built and which he wants it to operate on the face of this earth. When you deny that, you can get in big trouble with God, but that's what we've got out here with the church. We've got denial. We've got people who think that pastors should actually be doing everything in the church. And that's not the way it was ever set up. You see, when we get into John 18, 10, I'll give you a few more verses here. Then Simon uh, Peter, who had the sword, drew it and struck the slave, the Kohen Hagol, off his right here, and, and the slave's name was Melech. You see, could you imagine exactly what Peter was going through? Could you imagine what Peter was going to, through? 
I couldn't imagine. But then again, we all have our situations where we couldn't imagine going through what they're going through. Or what, how did they get down that path? How did they get so far down there? It's because they've got to make choices to come out of it. We've all made bad choices. And we've all made some good choices. But when you make some bad ones, you've got to work your way back out of it. And here Peter was looking and he was like, how did I get to this point in time? What's going on? And it was God's plan. It was God that made the choices. He knew that his son was sent here to be sacrificed. Jesus Christ knew. And he went willingly to the cross to be murdered. Would you be? Would you be willing to do that for your brothers and your sisters of Ephraim? Let me ask you that. Because God never leaves you or forsakes you. God never condemns you when you're trying, when you're shooting for the stars, when you're moving things forward. You give them something to work with. You step into the boat. You push offshore a little bit. Isn't that what they all did? You see, but we see in Luke 22, 62, and Peter went out and Peter wept bitterly. I could just scream inside for what they were going through. We've never had to watch somebody be sacrificed. We've never had to be, watch somebody be beaten to a pulp, crown of thorns driven into their head, stripped them naked, put on a, a mock robe, made fun of them, took those clothes off, put his own garments back on so that he could die with them on. Could you put yourself at the cross? And just meditate on what was there. I know there was a movie that was pretty graphic about it. I think it was called The Passion of the Christ. And the people there. How could you even cheer? What hatred was in the heart? But God purposes hurts too. He always has. He always does. He always will. Because he needs things done on the face of this earth. But here we see Peter. How often many times do we find ourselves denying in our own way? How many times do we find ourselves denying our Lord through our own self-sufficiency? Call it the Cain spirit, my way or the highway. You see, self-sufficiency can work in every single aspect of life, whether it's government, business, military, church, family, all systems in which we operate. But Peter thought, and Peter thought that he knew, but Peter didn't rely on the head. Peter didn't rely. He didn't rely. You know, see, and this is where kids, kids think sometimes they know as much as the parents, and we see that more and more going on, and this is why we got a mess in the home, because you have kids that are telling the parents how to run the home. Try it mine. Never did fly. What about employees? We get employees who think they know just as much as the owner when they don't know the details of the business plan that's going on behind the scenes, but they see what they know what they know. Make all their judgments based on their knowledge at that particular time. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. And then you get sheep. Sheep who think they know more than the shepherd. It's not a sheep. It's a goat. That is a goat. But here we see Peter too. Peter getting corrected. And this is the example throughout that was set here by Yeshua. It was Peter getting corrected. You see, that's why we've got to correct your sons and your daughters. Correct them when they're young, it says. Because it will be where? It will be in them. It will be buried in them. And they will know yeah, they're going to go through some stuff sometimes. They're going to have to make some decisions. Sometimes they're going to make some bad ones. Sometimes they're going to make some good ones. But the consistency and the consistent walk will work itself out and will pan itself out. But they've got it. there's got to be a type of correction when they're young. Just like the sheep. The sheep need to be corrected. It doesn't mean that you take the staff that the shepherd had, you know, the big one with the long hook on it, and you don't use that to beat the sheep. That's not what it was ever meant for. That was to say, hey, come here, little buddy. Get away from the edge there. 
or you're sick here, I'll reach over there, I'll pull you out. I'll hang on to you. I'll carry you around. I'll mend you back to health. But there is a point in time where correction has to come. And correction usually has to come from the offices. Every office that God has out there will bring a form of correction. Now, your harsh corrections will come from the apostle and the prophets. That's how God has set, set it up. That's how God has been consistent within his scripture. You can either like that, or you can either dislike that, but you can either be on God's way, or you can be on your own way. Go pound salt. That's just the way it is. I didn't choose it. I didn't choose to bring it forth like this. It's brought forth from the scriptures and the consistency with the scriptures, the way that God has always done, thing, done, done things. You see, but when we get into more things with the, the, the order, revelation knowledge for your, your household will come through the men. If the man is walking where he needs to be walking for his family, you will get it for yourself. But for the headship of the home, it will come through the man. You see, the direction from the the direction for the family will come through the priest of the home. It's not going to come from your son. It's not going to come from your daughter. And it's not going to come from your wives, guys. It's going to come to you. They'll hear for their own life. But the direction for the family, the things that they need to do, they'll get correction too from the father. Hey, you better start studying a little bit more, sweetheart. And that can be said to the man or to the woman. But you got to look at these things. You see in another aspect of it too, trying to give direction to another man's family is a familiar spirit. When you get inside the home and you think you ever are entitled to get inside the home of somebody else and give them direction on you need to, Look out, because you're just stepping in a whole world of crap right there. Because whatever you're bringing on them, it'll come back on you tenfold. You be very careful when you open up your mouth and you try telling another man how to run his family. If they come to you for advice, they come to you for counseling, great. Sit there, share with a brother. Walk him through. Maybe he's going to you because you have experience. Maybe you've been married for 10, 15, 20, 50 years, whatever some of these people out here who've been married. Maybe you go, maybe they're going for advice. Great. That's called wisdom. That's called wisdom. That's called you drawing on wisdom. But when you get somebody that's just, hey, both been married for five years and you shouldn't do that. You're going to look at you doing this and that. You be careful. Be really careful about what you're doing because you're contradicting God's order. You're contradicting God's order. It's always dangerous when you start contradicting God's order. Do we have to live in fear after this? No. Was this whole thing about order, was it about pounding on your heads? No, it was about encouraging you to get to the point in time where you're willing to push off the boat. Many of you have stepped into the boat. Many of you have done that. Push off. Don't be complacent. Get your oars in the water. Do something. Next time you're uptown, make it one point to try. And it's kind of difficult right now. Next time you're uptown or downtown, whatever you like to call it, try and talk to one person. Just say one sentence to them about the things of God. And sometimes that's all it takes to get something launched within your life. Give God something to work with. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. And let the word of God do what the word of God will do. Let's close in prayer. Father, how blessed you are. And for grateful, Father, for your holiness, your righteousness, and showing us, Father, how we're supposed to act and how we're supposed to conduct ourselves according to your ways, Father. We ask that you reveal to us more and more, Father, what you want for your perfect will on the face of this earth. And to all the people that walk the face of this earth, from the north to the south, to the east to the west, from one corner of the globe to the other corner of the globe. 
And Father, just bring it forth into the hearts of your people. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.